Good morning. We are here in Daleville, Alabama at Local Lodge 2003 or 2003 as the as the membership here calls it. Uh, interviewing Ray Moffitt. It is the 4th of October 2017 and this interview is being done for the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers Oral History Project at the Southern Labor Archives at Georgia State University. Uh, and welcome Ray. Thank okay. you Good for morning. agreeing to be interviewed. And uh, just so we have it on camera, um, I want to uh, make sure you understand that this interview will be uh, made available to the public and used for research purposes and documentation purposes and um, you are under no obligation to answer any questions that you are uncomfortable with and if we need to take a short break at some point, don't hesitate to let me know. Absolutely. And again, thank you for driving up from Pensacola this morning. So good morning for driving up. Um, and, and we're joined once again by Freddie Head, who has been sitting in on the interviews this week. Uh, so we might hear from him in the background. He has provided pertinent information for, uh, for us during the interview at time. So um, uh, we always start with this, which is where and when were you born? I was born where and when? Mm -hmm. I was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin on August 16, 1947. And what was it like growing up there? Well, I, I didn't really grow up in uh, oh, Wisconsin okay. because uh, my dad was in the Air Force okay. for 27 years and so I, you know, grew up wherever dad was stationed. So Did y'all move around a oh, lot? I moved around a lot, yes. So where all did you live growing up? Let me see, uh, we lived in Cheyenne, Wyoming, we lived in Denver, Colorado, we lived in uh, Marrakesh in French Morocco, we lived in the Upper Michigan and the UP of, uh, of Michigan and, and um, just all over, the, you know, I ended up graduating from high school in the UP of Michigan, so really didn't grow up at, at all in Milwaukee where I was born. Okay. Um. Was it stressful moving around so much as a kid? I loved it. You did? Not a problem at all. I, my family adjusted really well every time we moved. And mm -hmm. I, I think I adjusted pretty well every time we moved. Did you? Were you an only child? No, I have three sisters. Okay, so there was a group of you everywhere. Stop for me you went, sure. Speaking of that. Okay, so my question then was, um, so you had you and your sister, so you had you, you weren't alone in school every time you no moved no if we if we moved somewhere else, you know the the four of us when we were that age, everybody was in school, we just went to a different school, you know, checked in high school, whatever okay, and where was your favorite place to live, or the most exciting? I think the most exciting surely was Marrakesh in French Morocco, but I really, really enjoyed uh when my high school years, I, I had my uh, sophomore, junior, senior year in Upper Michigan, a little town called Gwynn, Michigan, mm -hmm. that was right outside the Air Force Base that my dad was stationed at. Uh, small community, very intimate, you know, knew everybody. So I enjoyed that a lot too. And after high school, um, was your dad still in the military? Yes, he was. And what was expected of you? For 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 when you graduated, uh, like would, like you know, yeah. if if even if your parents didn't necessarily lay out specific guidelines for what was expected of you, was it just assumed that you would do one thing or the other, or? Uh, not really. They they didn't really say you know we absolutely want you to go to college. We want, absolutely want you to do this or that. And we want you to work in a trade, whatever. But I played football in high school and ended up going to Colorado State and playing football at Colorado State. So okay. that was kind of my course after high school, my direction. Okay. And why did you pick Colorado? It, it was crazy. I, I was in Upper Michigan and I looked around and uh, my dad had been got transferred to Lowry Air Force Base in Denver, Colorado. And I thought, well, I can either stay in play football at a Michigan school or else I think I'll go out west and so I, we uh, I tried to send some film out to, to Colorado State they looked at it I went out there they offered me a scholarship I went to play football there okay 
And what I love Colorado, so and now I'm almost say I'm from Colorado because I spent so much time out there. Um, what and you told me earlier that you studied physics. Mm -hmm. What drew you to physics? What say that again? What drew you to physics? What What made that interesting for you? Just well, okay. So my dad was a uh, my dad was in the Air Force, so and I always had the dream I wanted to be a pilot. So I looked at different things that you had to study, you know. I thought, well, I could study aero engineering or I could study whatever. So, and I thought, well, it would be a good transformation to take physics. So I studied physics and it worked out. So I went on and eventually went on to the Marine Corps to be a pilot in the Marine Corps. So. Did you have a scholarship all four years? Yep. That's great. Well, it was different back then because uh, back when I went to college, we were freshmen couldn't play varsity football. So you only, you didn't get a scholarship, you had to work your way onto the, the varsity team and you can only play varsity sports for your sophomore, junior, and senior year. So for those years I did, mm -hmm. but not as a freshman. Mm -hmm. It was a crapshoot. <laughs> so as you were getting ready to graduate mm -hmm. from Colorado State, what were you thinking about for your next move? You know, I, it, was, it was per chance that I ended up in, in the Marine Corps. So I was walking through the student center one day and there was a Marine Corps officer that had a recruiting, little recruiting stand up. I just happened to walk by and he goes like, hey, what are you thinking about doing after you graduate from college? And I thought, I'm going to teach. I thought I was going to teach. Oh, and I had I wanted to be a pilot, but and of course I wanted thought about the Air Force and stuff. And I was in the Air Force ROTC in college, but this guy grabbed me, this uh, Marine Corps lieutenant, and said, "You ever thought about the Marine Corps?" And I thought briefly. I mean, it's Vietnam was hot, you know, so I didn't know what what I wanted to do. So I talked to him, and eventually he said, "Yeah, I think I want to be in the Marines." And uh, I ended up going to the Marine Corps Officer Candidate School, and then on to uh, Pensacola to be a pilot in the Marine Corps. Okay. So where did you <clears throat> go? So where were you? So you graduated. Mm -hmm. And did you immediately go in or was Correct. it at the end of summer? You just immediately went in after graduation. Right, because the program I was in, you went to uh, officer's candidate school between your junior and senior year of college. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you successfully completed officer's candidate school, you went to directly into the Marine Corps upon graduation. That was my course. I went directly into the Marines commissioned as a second lieutenant into the Marine Corps. Oh, because you had the training the previous year? Because I had done the, my officer candidate school between my junior and senior year. Did you have to go to any kind of boot camp? That was it. That was it? Officer candidate school. Okay, so it was a... It's different between enlisted and, and officers. Mm -hmm. You know, enlisted would go to a boot camp. I guess you could call you know that summer in between the junior and senior year it was 10 weeks mm -hmm. you could call that it's all they call it officer candidate school but basically boot camp for oh. officers yeah. okay so you joined mm -hmm. and where were you sent first uh, i went right from college right to pensacola oh. to flight school okay and uh, describe that flight school yeah oh man it's tremendous i love flight school it was uh you went in and uh we just went through as a class, flew all the different aircraft, uh, and uh, eventually become designated as what we call a naval aviator. Whether you're in the Marines or the the Navy, you're you're still a, a naval aviator because the Marine Corps is part of the Department of the Navy. Mm -hmm. So I was designated a naval aviator and went then went out into the fleet. And did you was Vietnam finishing up when you were? Yep. Okay. Yep. So you, you didn't have to go and No, start. I went to Vietnam. Oh, you yeah. did? Yeah. Can you talk about that? Um, it was, uh, I went there, you know, in, let me see, 1971. The war was starting to wind down. Um, sometimes you thought it was winding down, other times it was going great guns and just, you know, did my tour in there, flew off the ship. Um, Flew in country, so a long 13 months. Mm -hmm. So what was it like when you came home? Uh, 
as far as the the environment or how people felt about us, yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. Not good. I came back to the States uh, after my tour. You know, everybody wanted out of Vietnam. You know, the, the country was in turmoil as far as being there. Eventually we withdrew in 1974, I think we withdrew. So I just came back and uh, when I came back from that tour, I went uh, on to recruiting duty in Boston, which was <laughs> a tough place to recruit because I uh, had recruit places like Harvard, MIT, uh, Boston University, and all around, basically all around the Northeast, but in Boston. And, not a very popular place, you know, those schools weren't very popular places because of the war. Um, so I had a recruiting tour there after that. And you said you were in the Marine Corps until 90... 91. 91. Mm -hmm. So after recruiting? After recruiting duty, uh, I left Boston and went on another overseas tour. I went to Okinawa for the first time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and. Uh, the Marines have a great presence in the Far East, like in Okinawa and the Philippines, Korea, all that. So I did a tour in Okinawa. Um, and, and you're, and, and I would imagine you're, you're changing rank, you're going up yeah, in rank. Yeah. So what were your responsibilities, how did your responsibilities change once you were? After I got my wings, I was a pilot and in the Marine Corps you have different jobs in the squadron. So I would have jobs like logistics officer, operations officer, um, just different jobs that came with running a squadron, a Marine Corps squadron, or being part of a Marine Corps squadron. So just progressed up through the years. And then uh, after that tour in Okinawa, I went on a cruise straight from there, on an eight-month cruise in the Far East. Um, Trying to, re I mean, this came back from that cruise and went to uh, El Toro, California, mm -hmm. as a pilot. Became a general's aide there. Worked for a uh, three-star general for two years there. Went back to Okinawa again. Um, stayed in Okinawa, then came back from Okinawa and uh, went to Pensacola. Florida as a flight instructor. I was a flight instructor there for three years. Mm -hmm. Went back to the West Coast, <laughs> went on another cruise, and just, you know, cycled until I finally got out of the Marine Corps. So what kept you in the Marine Corps for so long? I love flying in the Marine Corps. I love the mission. You know, I like, you know, I like the, the mission of the Marine Corps. Uh, I like the esprit de corps that we had. It, it just, it was for me. Mm -hmm. My dad didn't understand it because he was in the Air Force for 27 years, but uh, and my mom definitely didn't understand it because mm -hmm. you know the Marine Corps is kind of scary you know, why? to moms. Oh, why is it scary? Well, you know they they you know with being in the Marines, what the Marines do, they're they're always deployed somewhere or they're involved in some kind of military action somewhere, mm -hmm. and it's a you know, concern to mom, I'm sure. Yeah. She didn't want me to play football either, but that didn't. So why did you finally leave the Marine Corps in 91? Just, I've been shot at, you know, lied to, <laughs> and et cetera. I mean, no, it was, it was time to go. I didn't, uh, I didn't want to, I didn't want to do it anymore. It, it was time to move on and do something else. So I got out of the Marine Corps and I was just going to, you know, retire out, you know, and then uh, progressed on and, and eventually ended up working for the union. Hmm. Well. So you got out of the Marine Corps ninety one, mm -hmm. and you were president of Local Lodge twenty nine oh two by nineteen ninety three. Yeah. So what happened in those two years? Okay, when I got out of the Marine Corps, I just was out and I was in Pensacola, and uh, found out that uh, there were simulator instructor jobs available. So I went and applied for a simulator instructor job, and. Uh, Got hired uh, by an office called Burnside Ott and went to work for Burnside Ott and uh, as a contractor, simulator instructor. 
and uh, had another job working. Okay. And, and I was a simulator instructor where I instructed, you know, naval, you know, guys coming up to be, want to be pilots just like I was and instruct them in the simulators and then, they, you know, they go out after they have their simulators hops, they go out and fly the airplane. And mm -hmm. It was perfect fit, I mean, yeah. from going from the Marine Corps into being a simulator instructor. Did, um, did you ever consider commercial aviation? Yeah, I w but when, when I got out there, we're, they weren't hiring, the, the airlines were in, in dire straits when I got out. Well, Eastern flew its last flight in January of 91. Yeah, I mean, it was terrible situations. Uh, um, so I thought about it, but you know, there just wasn't any hiring and people were being laid off and bankruptcies were going on. So it was a better fit for me at that time to, you know, just stay as a simulator instructor. And I enjoyed that a lot. So, so, um, Burnside Ott, mm -hmm. you started working for them and they were contracted to the Navy, the Navy to do simulator instruction, and is that a, on a base or a? Yes, it's on a naval air station. Okay, think, what's yeah, it called? It was Naval Air Station Whiting Field in Milton, Florida, okay. right outside Pensacola. If you're familiar with the Navy, the Navy has about six bases in Pensacola. Mm -hmm. so it's just one of their bases where they did the pilot training. Okay, and did you join the Union right away? No, uh, -uh. In fact, uh, we didn't, uh, the whole thing was that we didn't have a union and uh, Burnside Ott had the contract and they lost the contract to Ford Aerospace, a company called Ford Aerospace. Well, when we worked for Burnside Ott, things were great. You know, we, we thought, you know, 90% of us were retired. We were making, an, you know, an extra however much money it was back then to be simulator instructors. Mm -hmm. It was great. The job was, you know, exactly the kind of things we did in the military. Then a company called Ford Aerospace won the contract and they treated us the direct opposite of, of the way Burnside Ott did. They didn't, we didn't have any set schedule. We didn't have any uh, time that we had to report to work. They, they, they controlled us everything. We, had, we used to have to call in like four o'clock in the uh, previous night to see when we worked. It was terrible. It went, went from a great job to just terrible. So while I was there, I thought, this is kind of crazy. Why this? I don't like this, the way it would be treated like this. I'm a professional. I, Ford Aerospace didn't care. Mm -hmm. So when we were there, we, uh, we struggled through that. And then uh, Ford Aerospace lost that contract to a company called Laurel, the Laurel Corporation. Spell that. L-O-R-A-L. Okay. The Laurel Corporation uh, took over the contract. They're, they were basically Ford Aerospace with another name. <laughs> so we struggled with them and while we were struggling with them we started thinking about we need to be able to be organized or something. We need to be able to deal with these people because they're treating us terrible. Well, we looked around at every every option that we, we thought we would have. We talked to the Airline Transport Association. We talked to our congressmen. We talked to senators. We talked to lawyers. Nobody seemed to have any great interest in, or we were struggling along. Finally, I don't know, remember how it came about, but we talked to somebody from the NLRB. And they, he said to us, or she said to us, I can't remember, have you ever thought about a union? And we thought like, heck no, we have thought about a union. We're military officers. We don't need no union. So, But myself and another guy named Rich, Rick Howie, uh, we looked into it. And lo and behold, uh, we got, I can't remember how we started talking with uh, District 75 and uh, Daleville, Alabama, and uh, one of their reps came down and talked to us, a guy named Galen Allen came down and talked to us, and said, well, why don't you guys think about this? So Rick Howie and I went and started an organizing campaign and talked to all our fellow co-workers, and it was tough, but we convinced them that 
Well, what, we were, need to do. what were the concerns? Pay, um, benefits, working conditions, the same thing, you know, the same thing that the, the union offered, mm -hmm. you know, that, that we can improve for you. And we were working on a program called a service contract, which is, uh, that's what we were on, a service contract. We didn't realize then that we weren't going to ever make any more money unless we organized. So Rick and I were the advocates for it, and we pushed it, and we pushed it, and we eventually went to a vote, and we got union representation. After that, things got a lot better. So what did, <coughs> did the company sort of push back? Uh, what were their tactics during? Well, uh, yeah. Maybe tactics is a loaded word. Oh, no, that's not loaded at all. Um, the Laurel Corporation, um, eventually, bef before we organized or completed our organizing, or maybe just after we did, uh, was bought by Lockheed Martin for $9 billion cash. And we thought, like, oh, God, Lockheed Martin's here. And it was ugly. Lockheed Martin didn't want, never has never wanted anything to do with the union, and pushed on us really hard. But the guys stuck together. We won the election. I'm not saying it was easy. And then we eventually went into contract negotiations, got a contract. I think we chartered our local in 1992, and went on from there. Went into negotiations, and it's been organized ever since. And it's the only way to go into the service contract industry that, because the contractors change all the time. Mm -hmm. One day you may be working for Laurel, like I said, the next day working for Lockheed Martin, the next day working for Fidelity Technologies, and currently the contract is held by the Cubic Corporation. Okay. So. Um, so once you were organized and you had elections, mm -hmm. you were the first president mm -hmm. of the local? And what was it like? sort of, what what was the experience of having a brand new union and nobody to kind of, I mean, I'm sure you had mentors from the district or, you know, or, or right. but to, to be the first person to set up a, a union. It was, uh, it was hard, it, it was hard because the, the majority, all the instructors are all former military mm -hmm. and really a lot of them don't want, didn't want anything to do with the union. But they could see that the way to get to where we wanted to be as far as money, you know, pay, working conditions, like I said, benefits, that you in the service contract industry you had to collectively bargain be before you could improve. Mm -hmm. So it was a challenge educating everybody. I mean, I was being educated to the, what the union was about. And then I had to educate the members as to what the union was about. So it was a struggle at the beginning. And we were a part of District 75 in Daleville, which is about 140 miles from where we were. Mm -hmm. And we I think we were the first Florida group that was organized. And District 75, you know, with Local Lodge 203, and it was this gigantic entity that had been there forever. And then all of a sudden we were bringing on a new group and they're a long ways away and we would have to come up for meetings to be educated or the business reps had to travel to us. So it was a struggle at first. But when we started getting, you know, decent contracts, things improved and improved and now they're great. Mm -hmm. And did your contract include um, raises, pension? Yes. It, so you had a pension from the We beginning. had a collective bargaining agreement. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, and it had standard raises. It had great benefits. Uh, working conditions improved tremendously. We had no pension. If you know anything about Lockheed Martin, they didn't want nothing to do with the IAM pension. So we fought and fought and fought, and we never got the pension mm. in any of our CBAs or Lockheed Martin. You haven't no. even. To, even oh, we have it now. Oh, okay. But we didn't get it in to the contract with when Lockheed Martin had the contract. Okay. How long have y'all had it? How long has the contract been there? How long has the, like, when was the pension? Put in, it was put in by CBA. Fidelity Technologies okay. back in, let's see, we're about eight years into it, maybe back in 05, 06, mm -hmm. 2005, 06. I'd have, to, I'd have to look and see what CBA dates were on that, but 
but mm -hmm. about that time frame. Okay. So you were president for two years. Uh -huh. um, how long before you retired? Were you, from did, from the Marines or no no from. Okay, uh, so I continued. To, I was the president of the local. Mm -hmm. I continued to work at, as a simulator instructor, mm -hmm. and then I got very interested in organizing from my organizing right. experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was active in the union, and I wanted to be a rep in the union. And uh, we were, were new, and and you know it's a whole different type of union member mm -hmm. so I worked and worked I, I did some organizing on my own because I really I enjoyed that were and you then, were you surprised that you enjoyed that part of the work I was because all my all my contemporaries said are you crazy what are you doing am I, what is this I said well look what happened here look how we improved our lot here I mean a lot of people, you know, you retire from the military and you got a, a job as a simulator instructor it's great you know you go to work and and don't have to take anything home, you know, <laughs> you, you leave it right there. Anyway, but I was really organized. I really liked helping people out on a job that didn't have a, have a say in what they did. And I had been through that because these different contractors didn't care anything about, you know, mm -hmm. what we had to say. They just won the ser their service contract. They were making their money and they, they just, you know, come in, do your job and go home. Don't give us any problems, you know. But I saw many other sites along the panhandle of Florida that were in the same situation as these because all the, the military was standing up flight simulation all across. It was, became a big thing. I got interested in it and started talking to some people, did some organizing on my own. And I also wanted to be a rep and, and I thought, why, why are they not making me a rep? You know, I'm working my butt off. Mm -hmm. Why will they not make me a rep? I wasn't a true... In my opinion, I wasn't a true unionist, you know. I hadn't come up since I was 17 and joined the union and worked in the union shop. It was different, you know. I came in the union, you know, when, in my 50s. Or all of us did, pretty much, late 40s and 50s. So, um, Eventually, I got picked up as the district organizer in District 75. Okay. So, Did you feel, let me ask you this, when you were organizing... Because you said there were a lot of, there was a lot of uh, flight simulation on the bases. But were you ever organizing people in machine shops or anything like that? Never. You were only you were mostly working with folks who were doing the same. I was a service kind of contract work. guy. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, could I have? Mm -hmm. But I, I never would have any contact with anybody like that unless you specifically somebody specifically came to me and said, "Hey." I, and a lot of people, when you say, oh, I'm in the machinist union, their only thought is that you must have to be a machinist. You know, and when we attached on aerospace workers, they didn't, well, you build airplanes, you know. They just didn't, people that really didn't identify with flight simulation mm -hmm. with the machinist union, because normally we just say, well, we're the machinist union, we're not the machinists and aerospace workers. Right. Um, it, was a, it was a tough lift to convince all my contemporaries and my colleagues that, you know, this is something that we should do, that the machinist union was a good thing to do. I mean, it took a while to get past that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's still a problem because folks that are coming now, that are getting out of the military now, that come to work, say, at the site where I was, where Cubic is, they think all these wages, benefits, and working conditions just fell out of the sky. You know, they don't know the struggle that it took to get in that position. So when people complain when they're coming in and they and they may be complaining about joining the union, absolutely, is there, I mean, is there a group of folks who will like sit down with them and talk about what all you've had to fight for, mm -hmm. or yes, and, and how uh, and how did how are they are they receptive to that or if you. Um, you have to understand what how service contract works. It's, it's a very technical thing. Um, you have, like for instance, just to give you a little background, Florida is a right to work state. If you have a, a union on a, what's called a federal enclave, a base, and it's a designated a federal enclave, 
you have to be a member of the union to work at that site. Where if you're not on the base, in Florida being a right to work state, you don't have to be a member of the union. So there's a lot of rub when you come to a site, especially if you're former military, and you come into a union job and they find out you have to be a member of the union, they go like, well, why do I have to do that? You know, be, well, that's the law. Mm -hmm. so, but then they say Florida's a right to work state. Well, that's true, but this is a federal enclave, so you have to be a member. So, yeah, you have to sit down and talk with them, convince them that this is, this is the struggle. You're, the only reason we're here and we're not making this amount of money, instead we're making this amount of money, is because you're organized and the union's in place here. So you were about to say that they finally brought you on in District 75? As a district organizer. And what was that? What was that I, exciting for you or? You mean, they brought me on as the district organizer, mm -hmm. so I went around all just service contract work. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me, and did organizing. Like at Tyndall Air Force Base, Eglin Air Force Base, Hurlburt Air Force Base, Navy Pensacola, Navy Whiting, all, mm -hmm. just the whole panhandle. I went up to Valdosta, Georgia, and did Moody Air Force Base. Um, and District 75 at that time was expanding uh, into the service contract arena, other than Fort Rucker. They had contracts at Fort Rucker, but they were expanding out now, primarily in service contract. Now they have, you know, different uh, public sector jobs too, but I primarily work service contract because of my military background, because of my ability to, you know, relate with the people that I was organizing mm -hmm. and to show them different examples about how we organized at Navy Pensacola, how we organized, say, at Eglin, how we organized at Tyndall, and this is this this was the outcome. Mm -hmm. Did you get um, a reputation among the contractors? Did you ever? Oh, absolutely. Can you talk about that a little bit? Um, my one of my employers, Lockheed Martin, had several contracts throughout the Panhandle of Florida, and I went out and org. I was on leave of absence from Lockheed Martin, but I was out organizing their service contract sites. Oh yeah, I was not a popular, popular person at all. Were there ever any threats or? Um, like anything yeah. that ma really made you feel like you were no. in danger? No, I, I mean, I knew what I was doing. I knew how to, how to talk to people to, to get where we wanted to go. Um, did Lockheed, you know, put up everywhere I went, put a big fight against me? Oh, absolutely. But after a while, I figured out how to beat Lockheed Martin, and I beat him everywhere I went, probably 15 times. I lost one time in all my organizing against Lockheed Martin. And then after, after I lost that, that election, I went back and won it. So I was not, and it was crazy because after, after years, you know, I, I negotiated with Lockheed Martin also. And they would look across the table and I wouldn't be negotiating. I had seniority with Lockheed Martin, you know, because they had the contract at Whiting for like 12 years or whatever. So I was on a leave of absence, so I maintained seniority with <laughs> Lockheed Martin. I'd be negotiating with somebody who had less seniority at Lockheed Martin than I did. Pretty interesting to be in. So you did that from 99 to 2003. Um, at that point, were you no longer, you said, what is it called, a leave of absence from your I wasn't company? on leave of absence. Uh, yeah, I was on leave of absence uh, as a district organizer. Right? Yeah. And I always wanted to be on staff, and I kept pushing and pushing, and I didn't understand why they would, wouldn't pick me up to be on staff, because I was doing all this organizing. What appealed about to you about being on staff for the machinists? Mentors like, uh, and I'll call him a mentor, like Galen Allen, mm -hmm. you know, I saw what Galen was doing. Who else? Uh, I knew Jeff Smith, and he, he was, you know, prior Marine Corps, you know, and I started talking to the reps and stuff, um, and it just appealed to me. I, I wanted to do that. I wanted to, you know, be a representative, uh, especially in the service contract arena. So mm -hmm. 
uh, I kept pushing, but I didn't understand it. And we were new, that that section was new, mm -hmm. I think, to a lot of people. They didn't understand it. And uh, it was just a struggle to get recognized. In fact, I got very frustrated about it. And uh, a rep, a good rep that I knew, that I had worked with, came to me one day and said, Ray, don't get frustrated. Just keep doing what you're doing. Be successful in what you're doing. And eventually they, they won't be able to, to ignore it. Mm -hmm. Somebody will say, why, why are we not picking this guy up? Right. Do you remember who that was? Yeah, a guy named Bob Bradford. Bob Bradford, okay. He was a GLR, a Grand Lodge rep, that I had worked with, and he was negotiating a service contract. He was he was helping in the service contract, and he had run across me because I was doing a lot of organizing, and he was doing a lot of negotiating. And was he with the Southern Territory? Yes. Okay. Who was president of the Southern Territory at that time? George Hooper. George Hooper? Mm hmm In fact, I was at to the point where I was being courted by other union. And, oh, you were? Yeah. Okay. And I was going to leave. And tragically, George, I don't know why, but George Hooper's first, you know, he recognized what I could do. But there, I don't know if there was there any staff positions available, but he just wasn't interested. I didn't think in mm. um, bringing me on as a rep. And then uh, George Hooper passed away unfortunately. And I had known Bob Martinez and Bob Martinez came to me uh, in Cincinnati and said, uh, Ray, uh, I understand you want to be on staff. I've seen what you've done. And I had worked with him in the field when he was a rep. Okay. And uh, he said, give me a chance to get in place and uh, I'll give you a call as soon as I can. And he did mm -hmm. and uh, put me on staff as a special rep. Okay, because he was president of the Southern Territory, which, was that around 2002, 2003? Yep, Is that when, yep. Yeah. For, ten, for 10 years I think mm -hmm. he was GVP. So you became a special rep, did you have to move to Arlington nope. or Dallas? No, nope. okay. I uh, stayed right in place, right, worked, you know, out of Pensacola, and got my assignments out of there. How was the work of a different district organizer different than a special rep? Like, what changed when you became a special I, rep? I was a representative to the Grand Lodge, mm -hmm. where when I was a district organizer, I was, you know, represented, you know, I would answer to the district. When I became a special rep, I answered to the Grand Lodge. And how did the work change? Not at all. Not at all? You were still organizing? Mm-hmm. In you... fact, they took, I was a special rep in the Southern Territory and the organizing department out of uh, uh, Upper Marlboro said, hey, we want, we want to bring Ray on as an organizer in the organizing department. Mm -hmm. Was that when Larry Joe was still there? Uh, no. Um, oh, God. It was before, two before him. Okay. I can't recall their names. I'm sorry. Um, it was right after Larry Downing got killed in the airplane accident and then Larry, um, I had to. I can't remember their names. Mm. <laughs> That's not good. I mean, I just can't recall it right now. But two before Larry, tell me out, Freddie. Who was? Uh, no, I wasn't that much in the organization, so mm. I don't. I don't. the headquarters area. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> So as rep to the Grand Lodge, you were still organizing yes. the same type of workers yes. in the same area yes. pr pretty much. I it pretty was, much became the service contract guru for the, for the union because it was a, just a new thing, you know. Right. It was a new, and the organizing was different than, you know, traditional organizing of factories and, mm -hmm. and machine shops and what. It was, a, it was a different kind of organizing on the basis where I had access to talk to different individuals, you know. A, a lot of reps, you know, when you got in the service contract arena, you know, thought that the employer could hide the employees behind the gate, you know, and that you couldn't get to them and you couldn't organize them. Well, if you have access to the base, you know, you can get on there and do it. 
I didn't, I never believed that you had to do that, but it was a lot easier, you know, and you could you could talk to the employees around their workplace and etc. So. so once you started organizing service contract workers, mm -hmm. and you were brought on to the Southern Territory as a special rep, did you see the machinists sort of branch out more and start? Did it sort of lead to the machinists considering a new kind of worker in more places than just the area you were Absolutely. working in? Absolutely, throughout the country. Okay. Because there's so many bases and all the agencies, the Air Force, the Marine Corps, the Army, the Navy, the Coast Guard, all were involved in the simulation mm -hmm. training because so much cheaper than flying a guy in a helicopter or an airplane to, uh, to train them you know, get their basic training or orientation training or familiarization training in a simulator versus having to take them out and, and, and fly them in a, in a helicopter or, or a jet, you know, or a transport. <coughs> so let me stop here and ask, other than expense, what does a simulator allow? How is that maybe better as a starting point for training. Okay, so you're, say you're just teaching somebody how to start the airplane or start the helicopter. You have a simulation, simulator device to do that. <clears throat> By doing it in a simulator, if he does it wrong, all you have to do is what? Reset the simulator and try again. Mm -hmm. If you do it wrong in the airplane, you do it wrong, you got to do a whole lot of other things. You know, if you're flying and you make a mistake and you put the aircraft into a spin, or heaven, heaven forbid you crash it, you know. The simulator, after you do that, you say, okay, this is what we did wrong, this is how we can correct it. He reset the simulator and go through the procedure again so that eventually when they go to the aircraft, they're, they're not gonna make that mistake. Mm -hmm. So you can make those mistakes by, or you can do the learning in a simulator so that when you're, you're better prepared when you go to the aircraft. So when they do get to the aircraft, do you go with them there for so you are only in that first part of training, and somebody else picks up the, the training once they... Then you turn them over to the agency, that okay. being the Air Force, the Air Force instructors, the Navy instructors, active duty military, you know, instruct in the aircraft. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some places that they have civilians instruct in the aircraft, I know, but the majority of them are turned over, you know, then, then the Navy, the Air Force, the Marine Corps, whatever, then they do the instruction in the aircraft that they're, that they're flying. So has there been, is that pretty much how all people are trained now in, the, in the military? Absolutely. Okay. okay. Like you have, you have airplanes that only have a single seat. Say you have an F-22 that we have down at Tyndall Air Force Base in this district. Mm -hmm. They don't have any two-seat F-22s, but they have an F-22 simulator. So a pilot goes to the simulator and he learns how to fly the aircraft or do different things in the aircraft. I mean, in the simulator, excuse me. And then the first time he flies the aircraft, he's in the aircraft by himself. Mm -hmm. And he transform, or transfers that simulator training right to the aircraft. <laughs> and what's the success rate of the folks once they get out there? Are they well prepared for the, I mean, are there people that just get out there and go, oh wait, this isn't what I expected maybe I can't do that like um, I think like in the in the Navy Marine Corps training the mm -hmm. attrition rates maybe 25 percent mm. that don't make it mm. it it costs about two million dollars to train uh, I, I don't know how it is in, in the Army or whatever but or the Air Force, but a naval aviator mm -hmm. from start to finish costs about two million dollars in training. By the time you take in the simulator training, the salary of the simulator instructor, mm -hmm. the aircraft training, the salary of the the Navy or Marine Corps instructor, the students salary, the devices, the maintenance of the aircraft, all that. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day it costs about two million bucks. Mm -hmm. All in going higher all the time because Technology is just tremendous, you know. Well, how has it changed since you started? Oh my gosh, it's tr 
tremendously changed. Yeah, just how the aircraft, nav how you navigate aircraft, what their capabilities are. You know, um, when I started instructing in the, uh, say the T thirty four. Or T-28, I started in the T-28, it was reciprocal, now everything's turbine or jet. Mm. So just progressed along, just technology moving forward, moving forward, moving forward. How the airplane thinks, how, how somebody thinks. Like today, the, the, the students that we train or the pilots that we train, they, they came up playing video games. They get it, you know, they, they figured out. When I came up there, we didn't play any video games, you know. Everything was linear, not glass. And so. Tremendous change in technology. So even in the flight simulators, they have gotten better and better and better and better. Like you have regular static simulators that don't have any visual, and you have simulators that have visual that I can. I mean, I can't. But they map an area. Like if they wanted to fly around Navy, for instance, around Navy Pensacola and the training area, they have the ability to put in the simulator all the airports that you would go to all the terrain, everything's in there and they can put it up on a visual screen and you can see it. And then when you go out to fly in the airplane, it looks the same as it does in the simulator. Hmm. It's moving tremendously fast. I had another question. Can we stop for one minute? Of course. Okay. Can you say that you instruct? In organizing, mm -hmm. I organized civilian instructors who did fly military aircraft, who did the flying in the military, and training like in the, in the Navy, uh, you have the T-1, it's a trainer, it's a jet trainer that we, um, uh, civilian instructors fly that aircraft and train Navy Marine Corps students in that aircraft as civilians. You don't have a you have a military instructor that goes along, or and may do some instructing. But the primary the person who flies the aircraft and takes all the instruction is the uh, civilian. Mm. Um, how and how smart are the aircraft today? Like once a, once somebody's in there, does it tremendously smart? Like it, I mean, they think the airplane thinks for I mean, you just got to tell the airplane what to do. You got to be able, you know. Say you're going on a cross country, you put in all the coordinates of where you want the airplane to fly, mm -hmm. you take it off, you will figure out the whole thing for you. And does the military use a type of air traffic controller the way commercial aviation does? Um, we fly all the civilian airways, etc. I mean, on a military base you're going to have air traffic controllers that are military. Mm -hmm. But they tie in and they work, you know, with the FAA and, and their controllers. Okay. They they would be controlling, like say, I think here at Fort Rucker where we are today, I'm, I'm sure their tower operators are Army, mm -hmm. or they may be civilian now. I don't know. I mean, they, civil service. Civil service. They change constantly, but no, the it's all meshed together. I mean, if you're a designated pilot in the Navy, Marine Corps, Army, whatever, you fly the civilian airways just like any commercial pilot or private pilot does. Okay. okay. Thank you for explaining that stuff. I mean, because not everybody, sometimes it's good to take a break and explain the work. Yeah. In it, addition to talk, talking about organizing the workers to explain mm -hmm. the work for people who mm -hmm. might not okay. have a... Do you have anything else you want to say about that before we move on? About? The work. Love it. It's great. Do you still so, get to fly? Do you still get to go out sometimes? Uh, let me see. Yeah, I do. I, I have a friend that, I mean, has that we, we have a seaplane over in, uh, in uh, Keystone, Florida and stuff. I can fly anything right now. I really, it's, it's like... It's like riding a bike. Once you know how to ride a bike, you know you know how to fly. You know how to fly. Mm -hmm. My opinion. I mean, okay. it's simple. You pull back on the stick, the houses get smaller. <laughs> you push forward on the stick, the houses get bigger. You know I, what I mean? I was at the TWA Museum in Kansas City. Yeah. Have you ever been to the TWA Museum? I have not been there. Um, 
And uh, they have a simulator there. And I was like, oh, I got it off the ground, okay. <laughs> I mean, it's a very basic one. It's a very, like, yeah, you yeah. know. Um, but coming back down was really a di- more difficult, which yeah, seems to yeah. be. I was like, oh. Yeah, an, interesting, an interesting story. Uh, we went to the, the aerospace coordinators, went to the Paris Air Show with the Union, okay? Well, we went to the Lockheed Martin suite at the Paris Air Show. And uh, they all knew me, you know, because I was, I think I was still on leave of absence from Lockheed. Well, lo and behold, they had the F-35 simulator there. So our whole contingent went to, in the building where they were, had the F-35 simulator. And I remember we were standing around and the guy was giving a demo and everything. And I was just kind of in the back watching and stuff. And uh, um, Tom Buffenbarger was the IP then. And the guy who was giving the demo says, well, do you have anybody who would like to fly the F-35 simulator? And I remember uh, Tom turned to me and he goes, yeah, that guy right there wants to fly it. And he pointed at me. I said, that would be me. So (laughs) I jumped in it and the guy was like, he didn't know anything about my background. So he's giving me this little brief, you know, about how to do this and how to do that. And he goes, he put me like at, I remember, I think he put me like at 20,000 feet. And he goes like, uh. Okay, we're straight and level. You got it. Okay, I got it. And I was just sitting there. And got I said, is there an airport or anything around that I can land on? He goes, yeah, there's one over here. By side. He said, Do you want to go down and try to land it? I said, yeah, I want to try to land it. And he goes like, okay, it's over there. I said, I got it. <laughs> Rolled over there. Went in and landed. And it was great because landed right on it. And the guy was just like, holy. Yeah, we got a ringer here, and I remember Tom going like, "That's my boy right there, man." So it's pretty cool. Nice. It was a lot of fun. Very good. Because <laughs> the Air Force, the air, excuse me, the airplane is so technical. I mean, all you had to do is just tell it, you know, just small movements, and it's so sensitive, and it, it it's party, you know, it it thinks, you know. Mm-hmm. So you had to think for it, tell it what to think, but it'll think for itself. That was a great experience. I like that. Yeah, that sounds great. I would love to go to an air show in Paris. Um. Well, <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah, sure. You know, it's, when you go there, it's like, it's like a big arms dealer. You really? go around, all you see the countries just making deals for arms and stuff, or airplanes. You know, Airbuses, they're selling their product. Boeing's, they're selling their product. Lockheed's, they're mm-hmm. selling their product. Very, it's very interesting experience. So is it an air show like, you might go to the county fair and they have an air show one day and it's all like trick planes and um, vintage plane and no. things like that. But this is really more of like a convention of folks coming together to make deals. So if I'm, okay. yeah, exactly. Okay, so. so if I'm from, say, Germany mm-hmm. or I'm from oh, the, the Emirates and I'm looking to buy, you know, I want to buy... 50 triple sevens. You know, I'm talking to Boeing. We're working the numbers, we're working a deal, and at the end of the show, you know, you, they come out of the Emirates, buys, you know, 50 triple sevens. Or I want to buy, uh, you know, Hellfire missiles. <laughs> you know, they got countries there, you know, working a deal, and, uh, you know, however they do it, to buy missiles and stuff. See, a lot, of, a lot of money exchanging hands, I thought. Mm-hmm. I mean, you don't see it out there, but right. you know what's going on. Right. So. Well, that's a very different kind of air show than I thought you were talking about. No, well, there's some demo flying. Mm-hmm. Don't get me wrong. There, yeah. There's demo flying by where I'm at the Paris Air Show this year. They demoed the F-35. Okay. You know, just what its maneuverability, what its capabilities mm-hmm. are. Or they'll have an F-22. Or other countries will bring in their aircraft and... You know, dissolve those. Sh- you know, show how their aircraft, because they're all trying to sell their product, and this is basically a selling place, in my opinion. Yeah, what is what's the machinist role in a, in an event like that? We went because we build all those products, okay. and it was it was good to see the product that we built, the machinist built. We build Boeing's product, we build Lockheed's product. You know, we build Sikorsky's product, and it's to see it see it in action and how they you know 
sell the product off after we you know we build it so yeah. we're an integral part of that company mm -hmm. so it was an experience that I really enjoyed because I could see how the whole evolution went on mm -hmm. it's like in the military we are I used to organize people and talk to them all the time about we build the aircraft say we, we build the f-22 in Fort Worth machinists build it then the f-22 goes out to the Air Force well guess what then machinists become simulator instructors for the F-22. So we build it, and also we maintain it at Tyndall. We maintain, the machinists maintain the F-22. We have simulator instructors who instruct in the F-22. So from the day that the airplane is made to the day that it flies with the military, the machinist unit is part of that whole process. Do you think enough people realize, because I feel like the people who work on the planes and the people who do the flight simulate, you know, that there are all these different chunks and maybe those parts aren't talking or they don't realize that they are connected. Do y'all ever make a point of saying, you know, of, of like including that in training? I do. Yeah. But you know what happens in the union? It's like you get in your niche. If I'm a union member and I'm a, a maintenance, I'm doing maintenance, say, on an F-22 or it, whatever, F-15, because we do all of it. Mm -hmm. You just kind of get in your little niche. And until you go out to, like, um, Placid Harbor, our training center, or uh, you go to a convention, you don't realize that there's a lot of people doing the same thing that you're doing. And it, But you just get in your thing, you're doing your job, you're going home every day, and sometimes you don't realize, well, I'm working on this aircraft. It was built by Lockheed Martin, and I'm working for Lockheed Martin, and there's a lot of work that could be done in that area. Mm -hmm. So, you were brought on as a special rep to the territory, but then you were, in 2005, just a few years later, you were brought in as the GLR. I was brought as the GLR. I, I progressed from special rep. I spent my time as a special rep and then became a Grand Lodge rep. And you were, but you were still in the Southern Territory when you were? No, I had moved out of this. I was in organizing at that point. Okay. As a Grand Lodge rep. And at that point, did you have to live? I mean, no. You were still living in the I same area? I still had my home in Pensacola, okay. but I was just assigned wherever all over the country okay yeah and what was because that was very different i loved it try all the travel I loved it, yeah I, it was me and i got to work with i became i was stayed at grand lodge rep and then i started working i started working my way out of just organizing and got very interested in negotiating because i thought that the progress should be organizer negotiator contract you know keep it fluid throughout that because a lot of times in the machine machine will do organizing and an organizer will come in and do the organizing and then when it's all over they hand it over to a business rep or a grand lodge rep to, to negotiate a contract the secret in organizing is that at the end of the day when you have an election nine out of ten people aren't voting for the union they're voting for the organizer and if the organizer and then if you disconnect that organizer from that group and you hand them over to somebody maybe who had nothing to do with them during the organizing campaign and now they have to make a whole new relationship with that individual. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's a connect, sometimes there's a disconnect. Mm -hmm. So I got interested in negotiating and I stayed a, a Grand Lodge rep and then I, I picked up another mentor for me, a guy named John Crowdis, and I started working with him and I became very interested in negotiating along with organizing. And John Crowdis, along with the other four aerospace coordinators at that time, pitched to, to uh, Tom Buffenbarger that we need to bring Ray Moffat on to the aerospace department as a organizer negotiator in aerospace. And Tom Buffenbarger said, yep, that's what I want to do. And I was brought on as a aerospace coordinator. Do you remember who the other four coordinators or yeah. the other three coordinators were? Yeah, John Crowdis, mm -hmm. Gary Allen, um, <laughs> just 
get to draw a blank. Turn off a second. Uh, oh, no, no. Oh, well, if you can't remember it now, no, we can no, 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 later. Eldridge, Ron Eldridge. Ron, Ron Eldridge. And, uh, and uh, uh, Santos, um, Frank Santos okay. was the other one. And so you're moving higher and higher, mm -hmm. and you've been brought in as an organizer negotiator into the aerospace unit. Correct. Aerospace department. Yeah. Aerospace department. And were you the first person to sort of hold that dual role? Yeah. Well, I, I was the first person to hold basically the organizer in aerospace. Mm -hmm. But then it, it just it just morphed into negotiations and it, it just worked out better. Do you feel like you have a personality that is suited for the hard work of, of organizing and uh, but then also negotiating. Absolutely. You, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I love negotiating. You know, I what love, appeal? What's the appeal? I love the art of the deal. I don't want to, I probably shouldn't use that term. <laughs> <laughs> no. I like, uh, I like that, you know, I like that negotiating back and forth. I know what I want. I, I sitting across from that guy or that that lady mm -hmm. trying to figure out what's in their mind, what the company, can, what the company is going to give up, what the company has, what I'm going to give up, what we're going to get, how I'm going to go there, how we're going to, what strategy we're going to use to do that. I loved it. So. And you were still working all over the country, but reporting to the Grand Lodge. Yes. And did you have more wins than losses when you were trying to organize and negotiate for? No, I, I kept my win rate always high. I mean, mm. because we started, like I said, we started to try to organize and then move right into negotiations with the same person. We found great success mm. in that. So. Did you ever have a, did you ever, I feel like organizing is incredibly difficult work, just seeing from the outside and mm -hmm. hearing people talk about it. Were there ever any campaigns that you worked so hard on that just didn't, just didn't, yeah. Um, and what's that? And what's that experience like? You know, when I started organizing people, I would tell them, I said, I tell you what, as we go through this campaign and I educate you, if at some point during this drive, organizing drive, whatever you want to call it, you come to me and say, you know, this isn't for us. Don't feel bad. I get it. We'll, we'll shut down and we'll go somewhere else mm -hmm. before you get hurt, you know, the company's coming down on you and you just don't like it or you're afraid. Or if I come to you sometime during this organizing drive and said, you guys, don't, this isn't, you ain't got what it takes. Mm -hmm. it, it's not going to happen and you're going to suffer for it. Don't feel bad. We'll, we'll move on. The NLRB has a rule that if you go to an election with a group and you lose, you cannot come back and try to organize that group for a year. Mm -hmm. But if you have, during that organizing campaign, you withdraw that petition, you can only have to wait six months. But I would hate to always, I, I hated to ever have to withdraw a petition because then once you withdraw a petition, then the company just wears the union out. They say, see, those guys were never going to stick with you. Yeah. They were going to leave you. Uh, you are not union people. We asked you for a chance, you didn't give us a chance, and they just come down on them hard as heck, so. When you were organizing all over the country, did you find that it was more difficult to organize the South? No. Nope. No? No. Nope. No? And what, there's 14 states in the Southern Territory that are, that 13 of them are right to work. Well, I think all 14 are right to work now. Mm -hmm. um, Kentucky went right I, to work. I think so, yeah. So now they're all right to work. But I tell you what, when you organize somebody in the South and they vote to have a union, they're the, they are such strong union members because of all everything they had to go through mm -hmm. because it is right to work. I think your best union... My six... Everybody said, well, you organize in the South, that's hell. I thought it was easy. I thought it was... It's all in your presentation. What... The union has a tremendous product that we should be very proud of. A lot back in the day, we were, we would you know 
have the blitz program where we would just rush into town at the last minute and try not to let the company know. But if you have a good product, you can sell that product or tell the people about that product and they'll buy into that product. And the union has a great product. Better wages, benefits, and working conditions. Convince them, they'll go. And they'll be strong. Well, I think we have, I may be wrong statistically wise, I could ask the Southern Territory, I think our membership is around 84%. in all right-to-work states. Mm -hmm. It's not a cakewalk. I mean, it's not like organizing in New York or Pennsylvania or, you know, Illinois or used to be Michigan, but, um, where those are union secure states and the right-to-work states. It's tough. And you, and you can see what's happening in the country, you know. They want national right-to-work. So we got to keep fighting it. Have you, just having, you know, at that point, being at the Grand Lodge and maybe hearing from folks who were organizing in other sectors, did you see maybe some fundamental differences between the folks you were organizing and maybe folks who were organizing a shop floor or a, or a you know, a, a different, more traditional blue-collar work, totally workplace? Totally different, yeah, totally different. Uh, this, the skill set... You know, each each different group has its own skill set, and this the particular skill set of, of the people that organized. Are, you know, like I said, ninety percent of them retired military. Um, bring their skills to the machinist union. You know, there's n normally not a uh, apprentice program, a journeyman, etc. Mm -hmm. Nine out of ten of them are going to come in as journeymen because they have the experience. They won't be journeymen in the machinist union, but they have journeyman experience. Um, if you take a pilot that's been flying, say in the environment I come out of, if you've been flying, instructed in the T-6, it's a trainer. You get out of the Navy or you get out of the Marine Corps and you want to go to work for Cubic, who's that, the current contractor, and you want to be a T-6 simulator instructor. It, one day you're wearing the Navy uniform, the next day you're wearing a cubic uniform and you're instructing those same things in the simulator that you were instructing in the airplane. So the contractors get a tremendous benefit out of that. The Navy, Marine Corps has trained you in this and then you come right across, you're doing the same thing you were doing on the flight line except you're doing it in the simulator. Where in the other sectors, you may bring somebody in and he becomes an apprentice and he has to learn his tool and die experience, or he has to learn how to, you know, put together refrigerators or whatever, or whatever, you know, the skill set is, and then go from there. So, different skill sets for different jobs. I mean, if you turn me loose and ask me to organize a, a factory that had, like I say, tool and die makers and, uh, uh, machine maintenance people or machine mechanics and whatnot, I could do it. I'd have to learn all about that, but in the sector I was organizing, I knew everything about it, so it was easy. I, I mean, if you sat across from me and wanted, I could identify with you, you know, what your issues were, because I'd been through it and I knew how to do that, where it'd be kind of hard for me to sit across from a tool and die maker if I didn't know anything about it and identify with him and his, his skill set. Was there ever maybe any tension between you and other organizers because of the type of workers you had? Um, or, or how did, I mean, was there ever any, you know, this kind of organizing was pretty new to the machinists when, it, when you, yes. when you organized mm -hmm. uh, your local. Mm -hmm. um, were people maybe still wary, or were, were there yep. was there Absolutely. some contention or fear factor to the max. yeah? So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, because if you have, like I was saying, you have to understand the sector, service contract. A lot of guys, no military experience. That's that was the benefit of my military experience. No military experience. You know, you drive by a gate. Well, there's a guard there. You know, not a lot different than a factory. 
you know, you can't just cruise up to a factory and cruise into the, past the guard at the gate. You know, as the years have gone by, security became more and more an issue. But guys were just afraid, or they, they were afraid of the military mentality of people, you know, that are, that are doing that. And there was a little apprehension on them mm -hmm. to uh, do that. So much that we developed what we called service contract school, and we put that class in at Placid Harbor. And I went and taught service contract school, and the different territories would send their organizers or their business reps to Placid Harbor to learn about service contract. That's how important it was to the union. Mm -hmm. And still is. We still run service contract school. Did you go to service contract? Yes. Mm -hmm. Did you like it? Yeah. Did you learn a lot? Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Do you think that there were concerns that maybe some people thought that the machinists were moving away from their core values of organizing? rank and file blue collar workers absolutely i mean it's just is different you know um a lot of people thought you know that they're professionals and we were professionals in the in the sector i was working in we i mean had some struggles with the nlrb sometimes that they was it should be classified as professionals but mm -hmm. we got around it and I tell you, you can go to any, like, you can probably go to any airplane you want that the, the services fly. Say we organize all the C-17 similar uh, sites throughout the country, probably 25 of them. And it just, this is the only, this is the only way to go if you're a, a service contract worker is to be organized. Otherwise... The DOL sets the rate that you're going to make. They set the benefit rate that you're going to make. They they don't have any pension in it. You know they have the contractors may put a a four hundred one k in or they may not. But when you're organized and you have a CBA, you have to negotiate. Mandatory sections of bargaining have to be in there, and it's. The way you're going to improve. If not, you're just going to stay under the DOL rate. And if the DOL rate says you make thirty dollars an hour, you make thirty dollars an hour forever, unless you have a collective bargaining agreement. And a collective bargaining agreement allows you to pass through the benefits that you negotiate onto the government, and the government will accept them. Well, most of the time they will. But. Did you ever look to models of? You know, because you, you mentioned aerospace, but really to a certain degree, this is I, perhaps more truly aviation than it is uh -huh. aerospace. But um, maybe look to examples like air traffic controllers as a professional, professionally organized group of folks and um, pilots, commercial pilots. Right. Did y'all ever look to those groups as a, a yes. model to for? for professional when we first when my group we first uh, contract or contacted Alpha mm -hmm. Airline Pilots Association mm -hmm. they said hey thanks but we're not interested you know we searched around I mean it was a fishing trip you know until like I said early on when finally the NLR some a rep from the NLRB whispered in my ear mm -hmm. on a phone call said have you ever talked to the union and I, at that point I was going I ain't talking about the union but then we did and uh, I became great friends with Galen Allen and uh, worked with him. He negotiated some of our contracts and an old rep named Glenn Powell. If you remember Glenn, Glenn Powell, great guy. So you were a GLR for two years and then you became aerospace coordinator. So mm -hmm. somebody did they add a fifth position or did somebody retire? No, they just brought me on into the aerospace mm -hmm. uh, department. And how did your work change when that happened? Just did a lot of negotiating. So you were still traveling? Yeah, yeah. I mean, my job stayed the same throughout. Okay. I organized and I just, you know, morphed into becoming a negotiator. Because we had so many contracts that were coming online, mm -hmm. it was hard to cover the country. You know, 
was ser you know servicing all the service or negotiating all the service contracts, you know. So it was. Were you because you mentioned teaching at the at the at Placid Harbor? Mm -hmm. Was that during this time too that you yes. were starting to teach these service contract classes? Mm -hmm. And were you teaching people who maybe did not have the same background? No. That you, oh, no. That, that you did? No, no, no. At Placid Harbor, they would, uh, the territories would send business reps in or organizers in mm -hmm. that had, or even special reps in GLRs that had areas that they had service contracts in to learn about how to organize and how service contract worked. Were you allowed to sort of create the curriculum yes. for that class. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that process? Um, it, it was just, we did, a, we did a pilot class where all the aerospace coordinators came in and talked with a group. It was uh, F-16 instructors out of um, Kelly Air Force Base, and several bases around the country, and we talked with them about what, what they needed. Mm -hmm. And then we developed a curriculum around that, you know, on that core course, that pilot course, about how the NLRB looks at it, or how to organize, or, or how, also how the union works, because a lot of people we organized had no idea how the union works, so we had to educate them on that. Um, you know, brought in different representatives from the Department of the Air Force, like their labor liaison, or their um, we brought them in to sp speak with that, the Navy liaison, and how, how it works, you know, in their relationship with the different agencies. And, and just that basic knowledge of the service contract. The service contract's a bit thick, mm -hmm. established in 1947 at Cape Canaveral, right here in Florida. That's where the first one went down, so. Would that have been under Bill Essery? Maybe Bill Estrey was came through a little later. Cause I, I know can't he was, remember. Do you know who Bill Estrey is? I mean, I know the name. Yeah, um, I think, but he was a Grand Lodge rep, and he was at Cape at, at Cape Canaveral. Yep. Yep. So, but I don't know if it was as early as forty. What you said, forty-seven, forty-nine. For, no, that's when the act came on. Oh, that, okay. Oh, I see. It was organized. I think the Cape was organized in the '60s, late '60s. Okay, was that, it the Usher then? Yeah, that sounds. I think I think you're that talking the to the same person. Yeah. yeah okay. I mean, it's <coughs> it's so amazing where a service contract reaches. We had the we had the shuttle contract for all the maintenance on the shuttle. We I mean it's just there's the government contracts so much work out under the service contract act. Mm -hmm. that you would never in your wildest dreams know, know that, but they're, they're everywhere. You know the movie I, I refer to? If you get a chance to look at that movie, I explained it out in there. Okay. Not in great detail, but mm -hmm. understanding you'll see, a, you'll see a lot of reps from District 75, a couple of them passed away since then that were great helps. Um, Danny Givens and B.R. Brownell, Jeff Smith's in it. He's chief of staff now in the Southern Territory. Um, I think District 75, when I first started uh, the organizing for them, had maybe 15 service contracts. I think they're probably up around 70 now. Wow. So it's, uh, we used to say it was easy to catch the low hanging fruit. But we tend to get away from that now. Mm -hmm. But once you figure it out, it's a good way to go. Mm -hmm. And the unions has depended a lot on service contract. Give me a second. I had a question. I have a follow-up question. Oh, here it is. So. I've been in the job of Southern Labor Archivist for about a little over 10 years now. Okay. And what was surprising to me was to find out how many machinists were organized on military or like um, space program mm -hmm. bases. Mm -hmm. Would you say that there are machinists on, if not every, like base in the country? Potential. Potential? 
Absolutely. Um, but because I, because there's so much specialized work that happens. Here's a here, here's a story. The government can't do all these services. You have the warfighter. You know that's his. You have the warfighter, and it, this is all support for the warfighter. If you take a guy, if you take a pilot, for instance, or a, a maintenance guy, he has to. De he's out there, you know, deployed with the aircraft. They don't have time to do all this stuff. They have ser we have service contract to say cut the grass on the base. They don't have they don't have the personnel to break away from their normal job and you know in the air force or the or the army to cut the grass. They used to, but now they contract it all out. They don't have the people that can work in the the mess hall if you still have a mess hall or work in the BOQ. Service contracts fingers are everywhere. It's just not in maintenance or. Or pilot training. I mean, it's just every anywhere the government contracts a job out to be done, that they don't want to take what we call blue suitors or green suitors, military guys out of their role in the military to do their job. They'll contract those jobs. Be it if the the deal is if you had had to pay a service guy one dollar. To do the job, you can get a GS, GS probably to do it for seventy-five cents, and you can get a service contract worker to do it for about forty-nine cents. So the government goes like, oh, okay, this is what we're going to do. So instead of taking that salary or all that money that this individual would have made in the military, we contract it out. We save a tremendous amount of money, like all the contractors that we have over in the in the war zones. It, they're full of them in Afghanistan and. Iraq, the Dubai, all, all over the place, even over in the Far East or Europe, we have service contract workers, you know, doing jobs that are contracted out by the government. Do you think machinists are taking the opportunity to organize as many of those groups as they, as they can? Yep. In fact, most of our victories right now, most of our wins are all in service contract. I mean. You, you get this shot over here where you get, you know, a group, 100, 150, but <coughs> I did an organizing drive uh, in Pennsylvania at a place I'd never heard of. It's called Letter Kenny Army Depot. He couldn't have told me. I mean, I had no idea. I was at service contract class. I was teaching class, and the guy said, hey, I tried to hand bill um, a group at Letter Kenny Army Depot. And I said, who, who has the contract there? The contract is held by a company called Bowhead. I said, lo and behold, I, I have him. I didn't negotiate it with Bowhead in Hawaii and in San Diego. So they had contracts with submarines. And I said, they have a contract at Letterkenny Army Depot, rehab and army vehicles. I said, yeah. We went up there and they had a thousand service contract workers. A thousand organized them in two months. Showed them the way. Showed, told them the story of how service contract works. They were working with the Bowhead Corporation. Bowhead knew me, put up no fight at all. Oh, yeah? Won the election, yeah, and then went into negotiations with them. You just never know. I mean, um, I had, ne I, you could have, you know, if you said, put a gun to my head and said, hey, tell me everything you know about Letter Kenny Army, do you say shoot me? Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know anything about it. Right, right. And I got there and I'm going like, are you kidding me? Is this the way they're treating you? You can't do this, you can't do that? I mean, on a service contract? Educate them. Man, the right ones see the light, they pass it on to their contemporaries or their co-workers. And you can make it happen. And, and what is an Army Depot different from a regular base? No, I, I think the Army calls their rework facilities depots. Okay. You know, like Fort Rucker is, a, what, what would they call for? I mean, it's an aviation a center. Firm? Aviation, Aviation Center, Center. Okay. where I, Corpus Christi has re, has an Army Depot there where they rework helicopters. Okay. They just call them depots. Okay. What does the do the machinists have a lot of um, competition for organizing bases? We're we're the premier organizer in service contract. You can try to can I mean, if I'm organizing and mm -hmm. you're with a you know, one of the other unions, you can come and try and beat me, but you'll never do it. I mean, because 
they like it. I mean, they see it. I mean, they've got they've got some snuck in some different places, mm -hmm. but you're not gonna as far as what the machinists can do for you and the representation. I have companies call me. I can think of a company right off right off the bat. Call me and say I've got a group that has been organized by CWA, or I have a group that's organized by the Teamsters. They there the contracts beginning to be opened we would much rather have the machinist there is there any way that you can do something for us you know, when the contracts open it's fair game it's not poaching no you can call what you want but when the contracts open and do you it's on do you find that you typically are able to get the workers to yep. switch to the IAM mm -hmm. You know, it, it's it's all about who you send and how you present it mm -hmm. and what your product is, I think. Good product, good results. So as aerospace coordinator, like you said, you were still doing a lot of the same work. Just mm -hmm. Did you take on more responsibilities with that position, though, or...? Um, probably more intense, you know, with it, could, because I started negotiating quite a bit also. Um, after John Crowdis trained me up, um, then we would split off and uh, there were so many, there were so many contracts that had to be done, you know. Um, early on in the service contract, or, and like on my local, we struck for five weeks. Mm -hmm. We struck Lockheed Martin and stuff. We had strikes. I primarily handled service contract. John Crowdis primarily handled like lock, total Lockheed Martin. You know, I just handle that part of Lockheed Martin, so. What was, and how, I'm sorry, how recent was that strike? Our strike at it uh, was in 2000. And what was that like? What were the... It was hell, I mean... You said five weeks? Five weeks, okay. we were out. Yeah, we, and that's when we were initially work transition from Laurel to Lockheed. Um, it was because we didn't strike because our wages were bad, we didn't strike because our benefits were bad, but our working conditions were terrible and that we didn't know from one day to the next when we were going to be scheduled to work, how much we were going to work, etc. So we struck over the working conditions and eventually they straightened them out. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have a guarantee. In most places when you go to work, you know, you know you're going to work 40 hours a week. When we did this, when we went on a strike, we had no guarantee of work hours. So they, one week you could work 25 hours, the next week you could work 40, and the next week you could work five. I said, that's no way to run, a, run an organization. Um, you have people that have these skills, you have to have them ready to go. So eventually we, we got up to a 32-hour guarantee work week. Then we got to 34-hour <laughs> guarantee work week. And eventually we got to 37.5 guaranteed work week, paying 40 hours. So it was a struggle, but we got there. And were benefits contingent on number of hours worked? Sometimes. A week? Yep. Prior to organizing? And service contract you have what's called the um, benefit rate. Where the government pays, I think right now it's four twenty-seven an hour. Mm -hmm. The government will pay the contractor four twenty-seven an hour uh, for each employee to provide benefits to them: medical benefits, vacation, sick leave, all pension, all that stuff. Now, if you don't have a union contract, that 427 is set. You can't change it. It's a, but if you have a CBA, that's a negotiable item. For instance, the contract that I'm off of, the pay rate is 427. That's, that's what it is. But we've negotiated up to $11.40 an hour. So for every hour you, get, you work there, you get $11.40 paid to you for benefits. Now... <clears throat> Here's the nice thing about that. If you're retired military, you don't have to take the company's benefit. You don't have to take the company's health program. So you can take that 1140 an hour. That, that would be going to pay for your health benefit. Normally the company tries to take all that money and spend it on the, 
health and welfare because they don't want to give any to you. They want to keep it. In this case, you keep it all. It's a, it's a whole week of class. You're invited. <laughs> Are you still teaching? No, I'm, no. I'm, I'm done now. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, would I could teach it like tomorrow. To, I would kind of like to... I do enjoy... I always... I'm always learning about, I work closely with the machinists, I yeah. do a lot with them, yeah. and I would, maybe, I would like to. Ask Chris, yeah. I'll see if, I'll see if they See if can. I can go to service kind of, Jody teaches, Jody teaches now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Jody Bennett, um, with TL, but TL's retiring. But I'm not a member, so there's not like a fund in place to cover my costs, so. Oh, um, I imagine you could figure something. <laughs> or it might be fun to go one week and sit in on a different class every day. Audited. and Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a member. Sorry. That was the digression. I just, it's, I love logistics and I like understanding how things work and how people learn and things. Yeah, and it, it's a week of, you know, people come out of service contract class, the best class they've ever been to. Because it's not a, when I taught, taught it, it's a, it's a, you know, participation class mm -hmm. where you we try to figure out different things where it, it's just not a uh, instructor lecturing, and it's nice too because the instructors, I mean, we have the instructors at class at Placid Harbor help with the class, but it's primarily taught by an aerospace coordinator. So you come right off of the out of the field of how things are today. You know, you may come off a contract that you just did on Friday, and you're at the at the school instructing on Sunday. And you can relate back to that and, and give real time experience as to what's going on out in the real world. Not just pure academia, you know. I've always wanted the, the instructors at the harbor to come out in negotiations and stuff because, and some of them do sometimes, but you know, academics and real world sometimes you get a pretty good separation. Our instructors stay pretty on top of what's going on, but I work in academia, and I am always very aware that the things happening are. Uh, it's important to not only teach from the tradition, but to to put it in the context of things that are happening mm -hmm. in the real world. So Absolutely, not everyone in academia feels that way. Can I get one minute? Of course, I got to look. All right, we're picking back up and. So you were going to um, tell us about becoming chief of staff for aerospace? Okay. Aerospace used to be a department at headquarters uh, under the resident GVP's position. The current one is Ricky Wallace. So what, uh, it must have been about 2012, I think it was, that uh, um, Tom Buffenbarger thought that it'd be good to have an aerospace territory because we were covering so much aerospace. So he said, we're going to make a aerospace general vice president. And that became Mark Blondin, became, who's now the general vice president of the Southern Territory. He became the uh, aerospace territory general vice president. And uh, he selected me to be his chief of staff. So what we did is we assigned the aerospace coordinators. We had five other ones throughout the country, and they worked through the aerospace territory. The vision was that it would become a territory just like any of the other territories with secretaries and um, organizers and staff members, etc. But we had it for about 18 months. And first they changed the, the direction and said, well, I think we're going to do away with aerospace territory and make it back into a department under headquarters. And then they took General Vice President Blond and, and made him the General Vice President of the Southern Territory and brought Bob Martinez in as the resident General Vice President at headquarters. So if it had been a territory or state a territory, <coughs> would the plan have been, would it have been a territory out of the Grand Lodge or would it yes. have, okay, okay, so it wouldn't have been somewhere else. Because we had our office spaces, our office suite was at the Grand Lodge. Mm -hmm. And what would have, what do you think that having its own territory would have significantly affected how it 
performed versus being a department? I mean, administratively, I guess. I'm I think what would the I difference? think the, only, the the general vice president headquarters has um, so many things that he manages. You know, he manages the headquarters, he manages the harbor, etc. And a lot of different things going on. When when we had just the aerospace territory, just dealt with aerospace and all the coordinators that dealt directly with the aerospace companies throughout the country. I thought the the idea was fantastic. Went for eighteen months, and then for some reason they changed direction, and it went the other direction, and they put it back under headquarters. And you were there from two thousand twelve to two thousand fifteen. Mm -hmm. In two thousand fifteen. Did you retire? Oh, 16 it was. 16? Wait a minute. My daughter was born in 16. Yeah, October of 15. Okay. You retired? They retired. Did you Did you turn 65? Because doesn't everybody have to retire no, at 65? No, just GVPs. Oh, okay. okay, okay. I turned 68. Okay. Oh. I retired. I was 69 when I retired. Okay. I just turned 70. Yeah, because I retired and my, my daughter was born in 16, yeah, so I, at the end of 15. Okay. Um, are there any more reflections you have about the work? Any more what? Reflections you have about the work you did loved or anything it, else? every minute know? of it. Um, what was it like to retire? That's After hard. It was hard. It's hard to get across, mm -hmm. you know, to, to to close it out. Um, some other, you know, the unions are you know, in progress, you know, and different different things going on. Younger folks coming up, you know, you, you just eventually got to move out of the way. And, um, then, you know, with my daughter coming and stuff, I didn't, I wasn't going to be gone mm -hmm. anymore. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, it was. It was hard because I love it. I mean, I could do it today. You know, if you called me up and said, "Hey, go do this, whatever," not a problem. Um, but it was that time. Are you staying active as a retiree? Yeah, I am a lot, and been in the harbor now, and uh, I'm going around uh, with another retired Grand Lodge rep, Lou Brogna, and getting uh, retirees clubs going every place we can to get more active in that in Florida because there's a tremendous amount of retirees in Florida just not because they worked here but I mean people retire and mm -hmm. the Florida police come and get you and move you to Florida yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, are you <coughs> finding success in starting retirees groups around well <clears throat> we we're working on it yeah mm -hmm. I mean a lot of people don't realize you even have retired. I mean, different from where we are, there's people retired all over the place. This community here, for instance, we're coming up to take a look at Fort Rucker's Retiree Club just to see how it works. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, 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 they can capture, I think, a lot more people that retire out of Fort Rucker probably that stay in the area. Mm -hmm. Then it's kind of hard to capture that amount of people. We don't have that many people around in the area. Our, who knows where they go when they retire out of the machinists, you know, because a lot of them are military types and they're going to want to go back to Illinois or somewhere or different places. So we're working on it. We're going to make it happen. Is there anything else you or anybody else you want to talk about? Um, not gossip, of course, but any mentors or people you've worked with over the years or, or just your general experience. Is there any like, particular way you'd like to close out the interview? Yeah, there's one thing that I think we need in the machine machine. Um, and you, you said the key word. We don't have enough mentors. You know, guys come and go. Uh, it's, it's, for instance, in the district that I'm in, in District 75, they're getting ready to move uh, several business reps are moving, well, I think one's moving back in the shop, a couple are retiring, and so the, the knowledge the knowledge has to be passed on, or it takes a while to pass it on. We need more mentors that when these business jobs come up, 
you know, sometimes it's a popularity contest or people don't know anything about what the job entails. So we need people to get out and get involved in the union so that when those things come about that they're ready to do it. The thing that's kind of sad is that we get a guy who gets elected or a lady gets elected as a business rep and they spend the first, if they're on a four-year term, they spend the first two years going to the harbor all the time. Or they just take over contracts that they knew nothing about and they have to transition into learning all about that contract. And the job and doing it is tremendous, a learning curve. I mean, it's, it's straight up. Where I, I wish we just had more mentoring programs to keep people up to speed. Or if people are thinking about it when you're, say you come in the union and you, you're thinking about, it, man, I'd like to be a business rep. You gotta start identifying with guys who are business reps, find out about the job, find out how it works, mm -hmm. what it entails. If you have a family, you're going to be away from the home in this particular district. If you're representing people in Florida, I mean, that's two and a half hours of windshield time before you even get to the site to talk to people. Um, and then if you don't stay down there, then it's another two and a half hours home after you spend a whole day. It's a very entailed, hard work representation. I just wish that we had more mentors or people that just didn't say at the end of the day, well, that's it, I'm done, you know, somebody else comes in, good luck. Mm -hmm. So The reason I say that is because the mentors that I had were tremendous. Guys like Galen Allen and John Crowdis and those guys took me under their wing and said, okay, here's how you do it, make your mistakes, we'll, you know, I'll help you. If you make mistakes, we'll figure out what you did wrong, etc." And go from there. Do you think the mentoring program? Well, ha do you know if the Grand Lodge has ever considered that kind of a program? Or I, I've never heard it. Right. I mean, maybe dis different districts. I mean, because you know we're made up of so many different entities in the union. You know, we have the Grand Lodge, and then we have territories, and we have districts, and then we have local lodges. You know, and I just wish it was more seamless, uh, mm -hmm. you know, how everything goes. I mean, we, I know it's hard. We're spread out in five territories and two countries, so it's... Uh... And so during some of the conversation today, um, and I forget if it was on, on the record or off, it came up that, you know, one issue is that a lot of younger folks come in and expect everything they, they don't understand what it took to get that first contract. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that it's a more difficult generation generally to sort of, um, you know, to, to really, to understand how the things that are in place got, got to be that way? Yeah, because um, today's generation is so instantaneous. I mean, everything is like, texting, mm -hmm. phone, computers, Instagram, who knows, you know, all that stuff. They, they have to, people have to explain to them, especially when you come to work, <clears throat> take that time to explain to them, this is how we got here. This is how this all worked. This is how it came about. This local's been here, what, 55 years? I don't even know how many years it's been. 54. Yeah, so 60 plus years or 70 years. Okay, this, these wages, these benefits, these working conditions, this amount of vacation, this amount of sick leave, this didn't fall out of the sky. It, it was a process, just like the union was a process, you know, to make uh, for 40 hour work weeks, for, to get holidays off, to get vacation time. It was all a process. If you, if you don't understand where you come from, you never know where you're going. You know, you gotta, People say, well, history, uh, you know, that, but that's all there, and this is now, this is us now, mm -hmm. okay. This is us now can be, you know, if you don't listen to history, you you may repeat it, and it may not be the way you want it. So mm -hmm. I think that's, we have to educate those youngsters that are coming along, and I don't know what age you want to call youngsters. I mean, anything over 35 now um, is outside the millennium range. Mm -hmm. 
But you got to listen to the youngsters too. On the on the other side of thirty five, there's kids coming in to work at at the plant at twenty or twenty one or whatever, and learn a skill and work. And they got to understand the struggle, and it's, a lot of places it's been a struggle. Mm -hmm. Anything else? It was a pleasure. Indeed, it was. It. it was great. It was worth the drive. Well, I'm glad. The, <laughs> the windshield time, as you said. I, yeah, windshield. <laughs> I mean, windshield time is useless, you know. If you're on the phone, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. but then you're distracted, you know. You're trying to stay out of the ditch, you know. So, or you, you know, heaven forbid, you're texting. I mean, that's what everybody wants. If you don't pull over and text, you know. Or, mm -hmm. Our world is so instantaneous now. If I send you an email and you don't answer in five minutes, you know, I'm thinking, what's your issue, you know? Are you mad? Yeah. Did I say something wrong? I know. Are you avoiding me? Are you ignoring me? There's this, I fear of missing out, is this new, with social media and email, mm -hmm. there's this, it's actually like a, I don't want to say like a syndrome, but it's like this, this real sort of psychological mindset, this fear of missing out, like, what am I not in on if I'm not... You know, if some of my friends went to dinner and didn't invite me, how, you know, Where are they? What are wh they doing? What are they doing? Like, why, why didn't they invite me? Huh, all that stuff. Yeah, when I, I first can't. started traveling and all over, and, I mean, you couldn't, put your, you couldn't put your phone on in the plane. And they insisted that you had it off. And then, they, then you can leave it on, uh, and you couldn't turn it on until you landed and taxied into the gate. Then you could turn it on when you landed. And now you can have it on uh, airplane mode the whole time. Mm -hmm. And you can now, Delta just said now, now you can text free. So you can text free all while you're in flight. But it used to be like you, you land and all the phones would come on when it got to the gate. Then you would land, as soon as you land, man, everybody, as soon as the wheels touch down, the phone come on. Now, everybody, as soon as you start the approach and you can start picking up the towers on your phone, I, you see everybody, mm -hmm. they go, oh, the towers on, so their phone's on. So now, you know, 20 minutes before you land, when you're on the approach, you're, everybody's on their phone and they're starting to text, and, oh, we're flying on the approach. I'm guilty. But you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, it's just crazy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And my wife will text me and go like, if I don't answer, you know, she thinks, well, where are you? What do you do? I mean, you're right. You need instant gratification of yourself. And I learned, like, when I was early, I learned, when I found out about texting, and when I found out about email, throughout the military, <coughs> most contractors have a mill.com address. Mm -hmm. So I would be, it would, for instance, be... Is it mill.gov? Or no, it's mill.com. Mill oh, okay. So it would be ray, or gov, or org. Yeah be ray.moffitt at mill dot or, or lockheed.mill.com. Mm -hmm. Well, if I'm organizing a group, they all have that. So what am I going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to blast them with that email. Even if it's the government's email, I'm going to blast them with it. Mm -hmm. So, and then the government figured, they, they see all this stuff running in. So what do I do? I change my address of what I'm going in at. So, and then they can't control them all. I mean, they're going to catch up. So then I found out, well, it's got a little bit more controlling on, on email. So then the only way to get to it was text blacks and get, get their phone numbers. And then you just put your whole group, you text them, they all get that blast right there. And everybody's walking around like this. I mean, I could walk by you in, in Atlanta. I wouldn't know it. I mean, be looking at my phone, you know. <laughs> hey, Trey, hey, you know, and you'd be doing the same, you know. Yeah. Go to New York City or go to any big city downtown. You can't go out. You go out on the sidewalk. You nobody's talking to anybody. They're all looking at their yeah. phone, making sure that they didn't, like you said, miss out on something. Right. Yes. Right. And usually you're really not missing out on that much. You're not. <laughs> I remember the days when we first got beepers, right? And you get a beeper message, and the next pay phone that you got to, you stopped. And you had your call card. Your GTE card. Yes. <laughs> and you made that call, and the fo the, the ans it went to the answering machine. You're like, oh. Even before that, right. you sent a letter, and you'd have to call. Did you get my letter? You know? Right. Right. And sometimes, I found, like, I worked with a woman that would send us an email, and then she'd come to our, walk to our desk 
walk 30 feet away to, to our To see desk if you got it. To be like, well, I just sent you an email. It's like, that's okay. You can go, you can go have a seat. <laughs> I get it. Well, thank you very much for your time today. It was a pleasure.